There we go. <laughs> All right, thank you, Kutni. Yeah, so for the benefit of those on Zoom, uh, this will be more of a show and tell uh, session and we'll cover the different concepts as we go along uh, different photographs. Uh, later in the session, we'll dive a little bit into some technicalities uh, for those of you who uh, care about, you know, shooting, how, how do you shoot better with camera? So let's get uh, started. Uh, brief introduction about myself, uh, you know, primarily a shoot, uh, nature, landscapes, wildlife, and lifestyle photographer. Uh, by lifestyle, I mean uh, portraits, family shoots, uh, headshots, and whatnot, essentially people shots. I'm a Wayland resident, of course, and I've also helped uh, local schools at different events, uh, you know, photography related. That's my uh, Instagram, uh, Sachin Save for wildlife and landscapes, uh, Sachin Save photography for the portraits, and of course the Facebook uh, handle as well. Lately, I started the YouTube channel, but haven't posted much there. Mm -hmm. Hope to post more, uh, mainly uh, tips and tricks and wildlife photography videos. I hope to do more. If you need to reach me, definitely uh, use info at sachinsavephotography.com uh, and I'll be happy to help in any way I can. Uh, that's me, by the way, that's the real me. The, mm -hmm. Instead of the photo, that's me in the field. Uh, that was at Satyrus uh, Point in Rhode Island uh, with my long lens. Uh, yep, that was a few years ago. Uh, what's the gear? Of course, uh, you can see my two kids years ago uh, playing with a couple of cameras. Uh, I guess he's focusing on that stick. But anyway, uh, you know, we all are excited about the gear, I know. Uh, gear is not the main thing. It's, it's it's the photographer behind the gear that makes you know the difference. However, uh, we are definitely enamored by gear all the time. So just to mention, uh, Canon, Fuji, Sony, and Nikon, uh, you know, experience in those areas. Uh, I, at present, I shoot with Sony uh, gear. I have some cameras and lenses here. If you want to take a look later, I also have some cards if you want to grab. And uh, for the, I do use iPhone uh, and uh, for past couple of years, I've also been doing more of a drone photography uh, for which I use DJI uh, Mavic 3. Um, I prefer the uh, tripods or Gitso and FLM. And I do use Wimberly gimbal head uh, and Nisi filters. For editing, I do use uh, Lightroom on uh, my book and uh, solid state sand disk drives. Uh, that's about it. And cameras, uh, I do have three camera bodies at present, uh, A7R4, which is a landscape camera. Uh, E9 is pretty much all purpose, does everything. And A1 is a dedicated wildlife camera for me, all of them are here. Uh, I do have a bunch of prime lenses as listed here. Uh, I'll end up using more, more uh, of 600 mm uh, when I'm out and about in, in the field uh, shooting wildlife. And uh, when I'm doing landscapes, I'm most gravitated toward the 1635 f2.8. That's the lens. Of course, I have a bunch of other lenses too, depending on the case I end up using. All right, uh, let's get to it. So I'll cover a uh, concept, as I said, as we go along and uh, let's uh, get through this journey. So rule of thirds, what's rule of thirds? Has anybody heard of rule of thirds? Uh, sure. Uh, so rule of thirds is essentially uh, when you take a photo, uh, if you divide the screen in three by three grid, then the interesting elements of the photo or the subjects that you want to capture or portray, you want to keep them on the intersection of those lines. That's essentially rule of thirds. And I'm sure most of you have heard of or seen it in some ways. Uh, let's uh, go through some photos to illustrate the point. So this is a, uh, beautiful bridge at Plymouth, uh, uh, early morning shot. And as you can see, uh, I've landed positioning the bridge pretty much at the two thirds within uh, the screen. Uh, uh, definitely it is beautiful early morning when you can go and get shots like that. But here's another example. Uh, that's another shot. <laughs> that's exactly the one third uh, of the screen that I positioned the bridge. So that's to illustrate the point. The interesting point is you could do it either way, depending on what is your subject. Now, of course, both are, people may have preference over it. I like this shot better, but uh, sure, if you are going for that dreamy look in the sky, then this might be the one 
that you are trying to you know, show. Uh, so that's one example. This is a long exposure. Of course, you can see the water is smooth uh, without any ripples and whatnot. It's early morning shot, so that you will not even see much ripple in water because it's early morning. Uh, next, just another example, rule of thirds. Uh, Golden Gate Bridge, uh, you know, can't get better. Um, however, many times you shoot it. Uh, again, two thirds, if you see rule, the left side of the bridge, the left uh, vertical uh, section, that's the one I was focused on. And, and you, if you see the bridge itself is like a leading line going away, that's another concept we'll come across, you know, how do you deal with the lines? Uh, but that's another shot. This is again an early morning shot. Uh, as you can see, the sun is rising slowly on the left side. Uh, it was a beautiful day, I remember. I was on a business uh, trip there and generally squeeze out early mornings <laughs> and try to get some shots. Uh, this is another example, of course, uh, the vertical. It's not limited to only horizontal, but vertical. These two were shot in Banff, uh, in, you know, in Alberta, or province Alberta in, in Canada. And this is at Lake Moraine. And as you can see, like uh, my focus for the left, the, the photograph on the left, my focus was that little canoe uh, and with the two people in it. So if you see that canoe and essentially the line uh, between the, the lake and the mountain. And when I say line, it's essentially the area of those trees that was of interest to me. And canoe just uh, popped up. So that just added to the bonus. Uh, so that again is one third within the screen. You can see the rule of thirds is pretty much uh, prominent here. Same with the shot on the right hand side, the focus is on the, on the canoes uh, laid out at the dock. Again, a beautiful day. Uh, this is not early morning, though. This is a little later in the morning. Uh -huh. This is one of my all-time favorite shots. Uh, this is while in travel uh, at, uh, you know, Charles de Gaulle Airport in France. Uh, I kind of uh, think of this as a, uh, uh, what's the mathematical concept in? Uh, uh, Okay. Yeah, yeah. The, the, uh, I, 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 I blank out on, uh, yeah, but there's a, there's a famous concept of like two thirds, like, uh, I forget, I almost think of that always when I think of this shot, how the focal point converges on that section on the left. Vanishing point? No. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, yeah, there's a mathematical uh, number or the concept that's a situation. I, I forgot, I totally forgot now. Uh, I can look up later. But yeah, that, that's, that's uh, I, I like the curves. And of course, there's a lot of lot going on here, the leading lines as well. The leading, the lines which are off that curve too, and the two thirds, you know, rule of two thirds. <clears throat> Another example here, uh, rule of two thirds. This is uh, Lake Peto in uh, Banff again. Uh, just a tighter shot. This lake is very wide. I chose to go tight. And you can see the section of the lake, uh, kind of like the mouth of the dog or whatever, the right mm -hmm. side. Uh, that's where I was focused. Again, it's on the grid line the, at the two thirds from top and one third from bottom and one third from side. Couple of more shots. Uh, on the left is uh, Sanvapta Falls in uh, Jasper, Dance Jasper area. And then on the right is uh, Cascade Ponds. Uh, again, rule of two thirds. One thing to note here on the left side, uh, there could be something done better there. I was in a hurry. It was late end of the day and I had to get back to the hotel. And uh, notice how I, I'm still happy with my angle, but if I had more time, I could have had a better vantage point. I could have uh, you know, explored more on the right side and probably have gotten the entire circle of that Sanvapta Falls. Something to note, and not each photo is uh, good, but you need to uh, uh, make an effort to see different vantage points, what vantage points work better. And the more you uh, are able to shoot across different vantage points, you'll, you'll be surprised what you get. This is uh, one of my favorites again. Uh, this was 
comet Neowise. You can see the comet up in the sky, and the that's uh, Chapel up in Sudbury here. Uh, this is a composite of two shots. Uh, the landscape shot is taken at a lower aperture. By by that I mean f11, the higher aperture number, uh, and uh, so that I get all the details of the land. And then the sky is taken at a, a much faster aperture so that I don't get any movement of the stars except the comet, and then it's blended uh, later on. Again, rule of thirds here. Uh, as you can see, this is the Bachuset Reservoir up in Boylston, Mass. Lines, let's talk about lines, uh, leading lines. So this is exactly uh, an interesting point that in this picture, if you see, this does not follow rule of thirds. So there are times we actually break rule of thirds. We want to break rule of thirds. This is one good example. You see the focal point is right in the middle. And in fact, there is some symmetry here and there are lines going in. In fact, this picture on the left upper half is sort of divided by, by the tracks and the uh, roof of the station uh, between the left uh, upper half and the right lower half diagonally, literally. And I just, I just love this. Uh, believe it or not, this was shot on the point and shoot camera, old point and shoot S3IS Canon camera, uh, not even a DSLR or iPhone. So, uh, still one of my favorites. Uh, I call this uh, tracks to New York. <laughs> This is another example of lines, as you can see on the left side is uh, Heinz Convention Center up in Boston. And on the right, it's, I forget, it's one of the Washington DC uh, buildings. And uh, those are my two kids. What I wanted to uh, illustrate here is, yes, definitely there's, there are lines going in. There's leading lines up, down, everywhere. You can see that. But the main point to illustrate here is I deliberately inclu included the one on the left. Uh, notice on the left, I do not have any subject to focus on. That's something to learn. So on, on, on the other hand, on the right, I do have kids. So that adds more interest to the photo. Not only that, it gives a sense of scale. Look at the height of the kids in the building, right? So again, the photo on the left is not bad. It's a great photo again. But if I had any subject there, if, if I could deliberately ask someone to stand there or whatever, that would make it more interesting. So just contrasting the two, something to learn. This is in uh, Washington, DC, uh, This the station uh, in a subway. As you can see, I've tried to do a little long exposure there. The train on the right is leaving. Actually, yeah, the train on the right left and the one on the left had just arrived. So that gave me a little uh, motion uh, drama there. And of course, there's all these lines converging in the middle, right in the middle. Again, Another example, we are not following the rule of thirds here, not at all. Uh, another uh, good example, again, vertical shots. Uh, the one on the right is uh, up in Jamestown, uh, down Jamestown, uh, Rhode Island, and the, the one on the left is uh, Jordan Pond. Uh, if you see the one on the left, the, the one on the right, essentially, you can see the bridge is the line. There's a rule of thirds, also the lines, leading lines converging toward the horizon. Uh, but one on the left is an interesting one. Lines doesn't necessarily mean straight lines. It could be a curvature. So if you see those, how those rocks sort of, uh, just like a snake, they go left, right, left, right. And then you see the pond and out there, the viewer is led to the mountain. That's uh, another, another composition to think of whenever you come across any, any landscape. Rule of space, uh, that's uh, just like rule of thirds. Uh, just remember, uh, I never think of them as rules. Uh, it's more of a uh, concept or, a, or an idea that you can try and apply. Uh, like I said, ru rules are meant to be broken. So there are times you will break them and I gave you examples. So rule of space is interesting. What this means is, if you have a subject uh, and there's some activity happening, for example, this girl here, uh, she's uh, uh, actually, I did a family shoot of this family years ago, and she's looking back, there's something Michelle is going on. But if you see, uh, since she's looking back, I have given that extra space 
in the picture. That's deliberate because that adds uh, uh, that space that's needed that sort of shows that completes the story. She's looking back at something. Now, of course, I could have gone wider if there was something that I could capture, uh, but this, this is a good example of uh, rule of space. Uh, the other example is this, uh, a skier on Nashaba Valley slope uh, skiing. If you notice the motion is from left to right, uh, sorry, right to left, and uh, I have that extra space on the left. Though this could still be a wider shot and I could add more space on the left. But the idea is uh, you are depicting the motion going from right to left. So you definitely, uh, that having that space on the left balances it that, oh, it, it does show that you're going from which place to the other. So if you, if you cut this out, let's say you just take just the skis, not interesting anymore. It doesn't give you the idea of the motion than just the skis themselves. There's another one. This one, uh, I will not recommend anyone uh, do this. Uh, I, I did this uh, myself years ago. I, while I was driving, I'm guilty. I <laughs> took a shot myself with a little camera in my hand. As you can see, it's not perfect, but I was so happy to see the, the fall uh, and with the slow motion, it almost like ignited there behind. With the, that is really sh sun uh, setting behind the scene. And those are the fall colors and the red car really. <laughs> Uh, got my attention, but uh, I don't recommend anyone <laughs> do that. Do that while, while you're a passenger, definitely, uh, while someone else is driving. But uh, again, uh, rule of space there on the left side, you see there's extra space, deliberate space to depict the motion of the car going from right to left. This is interesting. You might wonder why is this rule of space? It's not exactly rule of space, but you could still think of like, imagine that's me sitting there on uh, Artist Bluff uh, at uh, in New Hampshire uh, on Route 93 up in Lincoln. Uh, this is at you know peak fall, uh, maybe little after peak foliage. Uh, but if you notice, I position myself. That's the subject on the left, and the subject is looking on the right. So what I mean is, this shot essentially it's a landscape. So it makes sense that it's it has to be in a landscape orientation. But having that like, that extra space on the right. Uh, subject looking at the right at the uh, at the scene and that uh, makes it that balances the scene. Uh, so imagine if the, this were to be like done vertical, where you cut off uh, part of the scene on the right, that totally loses the balance. So that's one example. This is another example in Banff, uh, in Banff, Canada. Uh, this was late later in the morning. Uh, Again, rule of space, uh, the subject is on the right and there's that extra space on the left. Though not deliberate because it is a landscape you wanted to show off. Uh, but notice uh, another thing I wanted to catch or rather uh, bring up your attention is uh, notice her hoodie, uh, the red color, that is intentional. So that's something you can think of whenever you are photographing something, there could be some elements that you can sort of pop. Uh, in this case, uh, had she left the hoodie uh, inverted, it would have been blue color, it would not. But it's because, I mean, I had asked her to deliberately keep it that way. And that pops out of all that blue, uh, red on blue. So that's, again, there's a rule of third happening here. Symmetry. Symmetry is another area where uh, we do uh, want to break rule of thirds. As you can tell, this is in New Hampshire in, in the fall. Symmetry is where uh, you do want things at the line of symmetry, whether it's vertical, horizontal, and then you can uh, really uh, show off the reflection. In this case, uh, reflection, of course. Uh, but again, we are not necessarily following the rule of thirds here, and you can tell that. This is at uh, Qatar uh, Airport and in Qatar International Airport on my uh, way to India, or yeah, on my way, I guess. Uh, it's early morning, nobody around. Like I was so lucky to get the shot with no one around. And this is a long exposure handheld shot, by the way. And I could get those sun stars. You can get those sun stars, by the way, if you are using a camera, uh, put your F stop to F18, F22. You can even try F16. Depending on your lens, uh, the higher the aperture value, you can get those sun stars uh, in your picture. 
again symmetry laying out here and uh, no rule of thirds followed literally. The one on the left is uh, Vermont, uh, Stowe, Vermont, uh, beautiful always in Paul. And the one on the right is uh, our own uh, Hamlin, Hamlin Farm uh, at OCP. Again, symmetry at work and no rule of thirds followed. On the right, you could say so because I've kept the focal point at one third from the bottom. This is an old stone church uh, in, uh, I wonder if it's at peak now, it's beyond peak at this point, but but yeah, this is beautiful to visit. Uh, it's right about 30 minutes drive from here. And again, symmetry at work. Uh, rule of thirds is followed in this case because the church is pretty much at the one third from the left. So this is one, this is a, one I deliberately included. And look at this, this was shot in the evening and then, uh, that's another principle. I won't say principle, but something to note. If you're shooting landscapes, especially uh, the patience is your uh, friend. Uh, if you think something is interesting and now I'm done, I got my shots, wait for half an hour or wait for one hour and you'll be surprised what you can get. So this is one example. This is sometime in the evening before sunset and this is right after sunset. And right there you have two beautiful shots there. But then that light doesn't stay on for two, I, what I mean is like if you see, I, I can I also got the ambient light to show off the fall colors and that light, which is hard. At some point, uh, that light is the only one, and the rest of it is dark. So just wait for it. Wait for it. This is another uh, uh, symmetry. This is in Banff, uh, Canada, of course, in, at Cascade Ponds. Uh, if you notice, this is a plain shot. Nothing crazy other than the reflection and the pond and the scenery itself. But the next shot, this is at the same spot, but other direction. If you notice, this is what I wanted to uh, bring your attention to. You see the subject, the bridge becomes a, a subject there of the focal point and the person in red there, which was just a bonus to me. I didn't expect that. But that's something to look for. If you're shooting some interesting subject landscape, uh, uh, in the landscape, you can actually add your own subject, whether that's person, bridge, or whatever. Uh, moving along, talking about subject, what's your subject? So often we, uh, so this is one good example, right? This here, right here, I'm shooting a landscape, but what's my subject? Well, you could say, oh, that landscape is my subject. But then when you see this shot, which is much more interesting because you have something, uh, not necessarily foreground, but but that catches your viewers' attention. And on top of that, you can uh, present it in, in, in front of that beautiful background. So that makes me to the question, brings me to the question, you know, what's my subject really, right? So often uh, you don't necessarily want to shoot whether it's people, landscapes, uh, wide or, or the scene at work. At times you want to have a tight frame and really uh, zone in on the, the actual subject. So here's some, some examples. There you go, this body, you're right. Often you've seen uh, eagles, you know, a wider shot, but this, this makes it so much interesting. Like you're, you're as if you're like right next to the sky, you're looking in the eye. Uh, it, it's a deliberate crop. Uh, so that, that's what I want to illustrate. So that's, that's my subject. I'm, it's a deliberate attempt to uh, zone in on the subject. Uh, this was actually interesting. This was at the uh, Roger Williams Zoo. Mm -hmm. I usually shoot uh, birds in wild, but I don't have any rule as such. I mean, if I if I find a find a uh, subject uh, even at the zoo, I would uh, shoot it. But yeah, it was just beautiful. I, I just I like the uh, tight shot uh, with his action trying to fly. This one is another example. Uh, this is Golden Gate Bridge from Presidio, I believe, or oh, 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 the battery, one of those uh, locations. But I shot a lot of, I got, you, I think you saw one of the shots before the Golden Gate wider shot. And then after all those shots, I pulled up my 70 to 200 and I got a tighter uh, look at it. This was after the sunrise and it was all, and there's not nothing much interesting I could get other than the silhouette because the sun was behind. And uh, but 
I really like how you see the city, there's a silhouette of, of the buildings up on the left side bottom. So that again, uh, I'm actually making the bridge as that subject, that section of the bridge and that that is my subject. So again, deliberate crop there with the uh, zoom lens. You don't necessarily need to shoot landscapes with a wide lens. Often you can use the zoom lens for the landscapes. That's another one. This was a drumlin farm uh, years ago. Uh, just, just beautiful. I just, I still remember that box. And again, it's a deliberate crop. Uh, so this one is one of my favorites. Uh, this is Taj Mahal, of course. Everyone knows <laughs> what this is. But out of the shots I've seen, uh, like a typical white shot, this really uh, caught my attention as we were walking around. Uh, this makes Taj Mahal itself, uh, and what is Taj Mahal known for, right? Like the whole world comes there to see this place. And that's what they're doing. All of them are standing there uh, and they are uh, enjoying Taj Mahal. And, and then you get the reflection as well. There's a reflection, there's a little bit of rule of thirds happening there. And again, uh, making the uh, subject itself pop out deliberately, not necessarily going wide, but deliberate crop. This is a uh, red-tailed hawk uh, up at the uh, Washbrook parcel in Wayland. Uh, beautiful, uh, I was hiding in the bushes and I was very close with my 600 mm and he, he just didn't know. I do not know if it's a he or she, but, but again, uh, beautiful. Again, it's a tighter crop. And that's my subject. What's my subject? Uh, that's mm -hmm. the bench. So I call that uh, lonely bench. Uh, this was an interesting one. There was, I think four or five years ago, there was this storm and I had to, I was taking kids somewhere and then on the way I had camera with me. So this is one good example that uh, always have camera with you whether it's phone or your camera, whatever it is that you shoot with. I just thought, oh, there's a storm there. You know, there might be something interesting at Dudley. And this is a Dudley pond. I just drove there, quickly got, you know, some shots and on my way I was, but uh, so thrilled to give this uh, shot. As if the bench is a personality itself right there. Uh, this is uh, at Asabet uh, River, National Wildlife Refuge uh, in Sudbury. Uh, these little chicks, uh, they were going with their mommy and daddy and they crossed one pond and they came along on the path. And I had to notice the angle. Uh, that's another thing I'll come to when I get to the vantage point. Uh, that's important. You want to shoot uh, birds, kids, anyone, any of your subject. The moment you shoot the subject at the eye level, at the eye level of the subject, that's a big difference. Of course, you may need to get your clothes dirty and whatnot, uh, but with the modern gear, maybe you can use the screen to your advantage and still be able to get without your getting the clothes dirty. But again, it's a deliberate crop. You know, that's my subject. This is a, another good example. Uh, rule of third is not necessarily followed, uh, but my subject is essentially not necessarily the New York skyline, but that boat. Uh, this was just coming back, no, not coming back, leaving a battery park for Statue of Liberty. And I was just taking some shots and I just couldn't resist the way that uh, is probably one of the petrol uh, boats or something. And it just stood out there right in front of the skyline, the red boat in blue waters. This is another good example. This is uh, in, in a wedding I shot uh, for a friend uh, years ago. And if you notice in all these shots, they are, there's a deliberate uh, crop again for the subject. On the left most, most shot is the cuffling, you know, the middle is essentially the, uh, the gents, you know, getting ready. Uh, and the right is again, cuffling. So again, tighter crops, that's my subject. Storytelling. Are one picture or are those three separate? Ah, those are three separate pictures. Talking about subject, uh, subject in and itself uh, doesn't uh, complete the story. You got to sometimes uh, tell the viewer, you know, what is the story there, right? And uh, sometimes storytelling helps 
This is a shot uh, in one of the family shoots and two little girls uh, playing. This is at sunset, uh, beautiful. I like shots like that, they're very moody, sort of bring up the emotions in it. I mean, this actually uh, asks user, you know, what's the story? It's like user can choose the, their own story if they want to paint out of the picture. Again, the same thing on the left uh, is from one of the family shoots. As a, this was not, this again, a candid shot. Uh, the kids were playing. This is at uh, Grist Mills at the kids were playing with the door and just, uh, I just couldn't resist with the red door and their dress with the blue skirts. It's just another story happening there. On the right, that was a simulated candidate, as I call it. I had asked uh, the mom to, if, if the girls could just start running. And uh, if I, I would have gotten that better had there been, if the sky was not totally blown out, uh, but sure, I'll take whatever I get. So I'd still like the, again, if you notice the rule of thoughts is not really followed here. It's, there's a deliberate focal point is right in the middle. Oh, and that's that's deliberate. Again, another story happening there. Who knows what the girls are doing? Like, what are they running after? Are they running from away from someone? No. This is another little story. Those are the same chicks I captured. What's my subject? That's my subject. These are the chicks, uh, you know, with the parents. They were crossing at a subject River. One of my favorites. That's my story. That's me uh, with my two-year-old uh, at right next to Ray, uh, you know, my neighbor, you know, right here uh, at Happy Hollow. I'm walking. I do not remember who I asked. Maybe I asked my wife or who, who took the photo, but that was my idea to get that story, like father walking with the son. I probably had something in my hand, phone or something, and my son is <laughs> looking at it. This is my mom. This is in India. Uh, the mustard feeds, uh, uh, mustard uh, fields. And my mom is looking sort of just taking it all in, enjoying the story. This uh, is my favorite again. I call that, uh, it's not necessarily a story, but it's an abstract story. So I call that when East meets, meets West. So this is in Jaipur, uh, India. Uh, one of the vendors, you know, had these hats for sale. I, quickly uh, got my attention, you know, how there was a contrast between two hats and color as well as, you know, it's a cultural contrast too. Patterns, often uh, we come across patterns in around us and uh, they are wonderful to capture. This is uh, strawberries captured right at home. Uh, I used a 35 mm lens for this. Uh, this was not macro, but kind of like macro. That lens had a bit of macro and not, not necessarily a macro lens, but it's a close-up shot. You can uh, get close uh, to any subject, like within your subject, uh, once the one I mentioned was the, what's my subject, which is you sort of do a tighter frame, but you could go even further tighter and uh, focus on an area of a subject. And that could become, that could show you some patterns uh, right there. For example, this is a building at, this is in India in Mumbai, uh, it's the Oberai Towers, uh, one of the hotels at Merriman Mer Point. Uh, it's just a section, right? a slice of a, of a uh, building. Beautiful pattern there. This is uh, in Las Vegas, one of the casinos uh, looking up. I believe it's Bellagio. Uh, uh, yeah. And uh, looking up at the, the ceiling, you see this. And I, I don't know if they still have it. It's, it's just beautiful. This was shot with, uh, again, uh, old uh, point and shoot camera by uh, Washington DC, a uh, bunch of bikes for rent. Another pattern you see. This was right in uh, at uh, truck, touch a truck day uh, in Valen, uh, bunch of balls. I call that, uh, call this more like, uh, you know, none of, none of us are perfect, but each one of us is unique. You know, that sort of a message of diversity uh, their unity and diversity. Vantage points. Now, vantage points, again, uh, sometime back I mentioned uh, kids, birds, uh, there are ways you can shoot, uh, you want to be at the eye level of the subject. So that's that's one of the uh, 
uh, key things. Depending on the scene, you can vary your vantage point. This is one good example, one of the family shoots. Uh, you get low to where the girls were. This is a truly candid shot. And uh, look how beautiful that is. I mean, imagine shooting this up from top versus any other angle. Uh, this sort of gets us into uh, the subjects uh, almost like personal space. But again, this is shot with a longer lens. I mean, I'm not closer to the girls. I was probably 100 feet away or something. I have a long lens uh, doing, getting, giving me the compression effect and the background blur. This is a, a, one of my all time favorites. Again, uh, this is at uh, Easter. That's my son and his foot. I often wonder how do I capture Easter? And it's, it's so difficult. And then honestly, I was with my, one of my simple cameras, you know, nothing fancy with just a pancake lens on it. And I was trying different vantage points. This is, I deliberately, deliberately included this shot to show you uh, how a unique vantage point can, uh, you know, uh, this, this also is telling a story. There's, there are eggs out there, there is Easter hunt happening. You can see all the people and, that, and that's my kid with the bucket. He was very happy. I think he got lots of eggs that day, like the most he could get. Uh, but that's another unique, I was like way low. I, I'm pretty sure I got all my clothes dirty there that day. But this is again, uh, very low uh, where the kids were seated at, at Chris, Chris Mill again. Um, another vantage point. Talking about vantage points, we are in a world of drones. And uh, again, this was not a shot by drone. This was in CN Tower uh, in uh, Canada. But do take advantage wherever you go. If you are up high in, at a tower or hill mountain, you are going to get different uh, vantage point there. And you, you'll be surprised what you get with, you can never get with your camera just uh, being where you are. These are, these are some drone shots I included. Uh, because we we're talking about vantage points. Drones really give you a totally different uh, view altogether. My camera can never do that. And I'm so thrilled to be shooting with drones. Hope to shoot more. So this was a hairpin turn uh, at uh, Kankamangas Highway. <coughs> this is beyond peak, I guess. This is a uh, church in Wanalaset, I guess, uh, in somewhere uh, in near uh, Lake Winnipesaukee. But again, uh, I got that difference of the color, the contrast and the color of the greens and, and the church as well as the mountains behind. This is again in uh, New Hampshire mountains, uh, the unique vantage point you can never get with the camera. Definitely exper experiment with all sorts of vantage points you can get, whether it's drone or a cell phone, you can even raise the cell phone with a selfie stick. You never know what all you can, what kind of view you can. This is one of my favorites. Light, uh, light is very important. Uh, if you shoot in the morning, typically in the morning, uh, golden hour, that's after the sunrise, one hour after the sunrise, and then in the evening, one hour before the sunset, that's the golden hour. Uh, often when I go to shoot in the morning, uh, you want to shoot uh, way early, uh, even uh, 40 minutes before the sunrise. Uh, so this is an example. This is at Fan Pier in Boston. Uh, this was uh, 40, 50 minutes before sunrise. And it's just, just beautiful blue in the sky. And of course, I got many more shots later. But that, that time of the, again, light plays an uh, important role depending on type of time of the day. This is like, this is where I was looking at Boston, and this is looking away. The same place, same uh, time, uh, I get so much different color again in the morning, early morning. On the left is uh, at middle school, uh, one of the super moons. Uh, that was a deliberate crop again, but again, different time of the day. On the right is uh, in uh, Bharatpur, uh, that's a bird sanctuary in India, and that's in the morning, early morning, uh, right after sunrise. So two different times, but again, what light, what difference light can make? Left being special because of the supermoon. This is again light uh, 
falling on that building at Niagara Falls, uh, early morning, sunrise, uh, beautiful light, just don't need to do anything, just nature does it all. Again, as the sun came up further, I got this beautiful effect. The, the, these both are long, this is also long exposure, a little bit, not as much as this one. This is way uh, longer exposure. So you get the effect in the water. The left is the uh, famous fort, the highest point in Jaipur in Jaipur, India. That is at the sunset. The light, right one is also at the sunset, but that's in the, at the Bharatpur uh, sanctuary, the bird sanctuary. Again, the, the placement of the bird, uh, the silhouette was deliberate. Notice uh, this is in the light section because I wanted to show how the on the left, I'm actually using the light uh, that illuminates the fort and the city and sun is setting, of course, but on the right, uh, it's not the light. It's a, I'm actually using the silhouette of the bird. It's not, it's the way opposite really. I mean, typically when I shoot birds, I would want light to be on the bird, but this was, this uh, makes it much more interesting with the orange sun in the background setting and silhouette of a kingfisher. This is another great example, uh, Lake Moran in Banff. This was way early, uh, before sunrise, uh, only my camera could see this. I could not see this with my dead eye, really. I mean, this was uh, really foggy, but but it's still a beautiful shot. I mean, nevertheless, I can't get a shot like that. But you can even see the light if you see if you see on the right side, uh, uh, halfway through, uh, uh, or maybe two thirds, uh, maybe one third from the bottom. There's a light at that one of that buildings there, right, right here. So it's really dark, it's, it's, you can't see. But then uh, right after the sunrise, which is still just after the sunrise, this, this is what I saw. Wow. So again, the reason I brought these two pictures is, you know, if you think you are done shooting, you no, know, wait till you get more. Uh, again, time is the problem. I mean, when we are usually traveling, you know, we don't have that much time and cannot possibly wait at one location too, too long. But this is one great example, you know, what you can get. Same. This uh, is ice castles in uh, New Hampshire. Uh, on the left are my two kids, uh, you know, and on the right is my younger kid. Again, one good example on the left is when sun was setting. So I use the, uh, you see how the sky is, that contrasting against the blue of the, the ice castle itself and my kids doing their thing, it's a subject. On the right was a deliberate uh, position. I, I actually, I asked my kid to, if he could go and just stand there. And I was just thrilled just the way he stood like that. that that's one of my all time favorite shots. It's, it, it looks, I mean, I always imagine this to be like a, the cover of a book or something. <laughs> There's like a story happening there. But again, uh, again, using the light to your advantage. Uh, there's a lot of play of light at, at ice castles and you can always use that to your advantage. This is another example. Uh, it's a long exposure fireworks at Niagara Falls. Nighttime shot. Use the light to your advantage. The idea is I can uh, capture the fireworks illuminating the sky with all those shapes and colors. At the same time, uh, the light illuminating the falls itself on the right so balances everything together. This is another shot from the uh, from the tower up up there, CN Tower, I believe, in in Canada. But uh, subject being the boat, that's I think the uh, one of the last rides. Yeah, it actually waits there. Uh, it's just beautiful. I mean, I'm just going to explain how. This is again artist bluff. Uh, early morning shot. Uh, reward of uh, climbing up the mountain, steep climb early morning. This is again early morning at, uh, no, this is not early morning, sorry. This was at sunset at uh, Marshall Be Marshall's Beach in uh, San Francisco. Uh, as you can see, it's a long exposure. It's probably about between two and three minutes. That's why you can see all that water almost giving an effect as if it's like an ethereal effect. If, Heavenish, I suppose. But but then the, the thing I wanted to show was this. If you see uh, the light there, there's still light. It's sun is about to set. Uh, but then if you see next chart, the sun has set almost. No, the sun has set actually. 
And that's why you see the lights on the bridge. Again, two different shots at the same time, but a little later, but you see what you can get with, the, with those lights there. So wait for it, wait for it in landscape. This is my mom exploring at, uh, this is an iPhone shot, by the way. It's not even a fancy, not within DSLR. But again, early morning shot. Uh, my mom uh, is definitely very cold. She feels very cold there in the morning. Again, subject position at two thirds. Black and white. Uh, this is more of a storytelling shot. Uh, this is back in India, uh, one of the local trains. Uh, black and white is something you want to use when uh, you you are deliberately focusing on the on the story itself or the subject itself, and you want to actually remove all the rest of the distractions, so to speak. So this was my attempt to do that because there, there there's a lot going on there. If I if it was a color shot. Uh, it would not had a, uh, you know, add to the story as much as this. Uh, so that's just just my view. Of this. There's leading lines happening, of course, in this shot. Then this is one of my favorites. Uh, this I call this shot uh, "Thinking Cow." Uh, that's a cow at uh, Drumlin Farm. Uh, what this was natural light shot. Uh, nothing fancy. The light coming in. To the barn, the cow is there, and this again uh, shot with a long lens. You can see the compression. I was really, really thrilled to see that border, just highlighting. You know, I didn't want anything else. Again, use of uh, light. This is again nighttime shot. If you notice, the my focus is not on the moon, but on the tree and all that's going on, for what it's worth, some kind of an abstract. Uh, art. Again, on the left, uh, one of the super moons. Uh, I was. That's a good example of uh, frame your subject, right? That's another idea. Your the the all those trees are actually framing the moon. Uh, uh, beautiful, beautiful. Just all you need is a black and white picture. There, there's nothing. The same thing on the right. Uh, that's Oculus in New York. Uh, if you notice, Oculus is one place where just the structure of the place, uh, there's a lot of play of light. So you can always, at a place like that, where a lot of play of light, uh, often uh, put your camera in black and white more. more. More likely your camera is going to shoot uh, in color. Even if you put it in black and white, the, the shot that is captured will have colors. It's just that you'll be able to see in black and white. So sometimes when I uh, look at subjects where there's a lot of play of light, I want to, uh, get the tonality of, of the scene and then I would put it in black and white and shoot that. That's a good example of the one. This is a uh, super moon, uh, this is a middle school. This is a composite of two shots, uh, the moon taken with a long lens and then the landscape taken with a wider lens. But again, uh, light does it all. This is uh, Toronto, uh, one of the islands, center island, right in front of Toronto, and you can get this beautiful view. As you notice, this is a, this is an HDR shot. There's some editing happen after the shot, so it's not, but it's still uh, the scene was exactly the same, except the the kind of uh, effect you see in the water. That's because of the long exposure and HDR effect uh, later on. How much time do we have? We have. Yeah, we can we can we can breeze through this. Uh, uh, so, if if you shoot with your camera, there are three things to note. Of course, there's a lot more we can cover, but you know, out of scope for today's uh, you know lack of time. Aperture, shutter, and ISO. Right? Aperture. What, what is aperture? Aperture is the opening of the lens in your camera, and the more the lens is open the sharper uh, you get the details of the scene. You get more and more in focus of the scene. So this is, this is the aperture. So typically when you shoot landscape, you're shooting landscape at F11, right? That's the optimum for landscapes. Uh, when you shoot group, you, you probably want to shoot groups. Uh, this is again, all the full frame equivalent. 
If you are shooting uh, the APS-C cameras, then uh, due to the crop factor, you could go lower. On APS-C, you could even go F4 or F5.6, and you would still have entire scene in focus. But on full frame, F11 and F8 are the two uh, f-stops where you can get everything in focus. So what this means is uh, at f11 or higher, right, this way, this direction, you are going to get more and more in focus. If you are at f1.4 or f2.8, you're going to focus on the subject and the rest of it behind the subject is going to be out of focus. So this explains that. You see here, that's the person taking the shot and that's the moose. So here, the aperture is at f2.8. And you see the moose is not in focus because the plane of focus is here, this eight, right? So that the flowers are in focus. When the aperture is at f5.6, then there's more in focus because you have more in the plane of focus. So that's the plane of focus. Now you have moose and the flowers in focus, right? The behind, all these trees are still out of focus. And when you go F11, you are going to get everything in focus because you now have greater depth of field. Uh, so with the higher the aperture, you get more depth of field and lower the aperture value, which is more uh, opening of the lens, you get shallower depth of field. So that's a technique you always use. That's why you see all the portrait shots uh, where you see the background blurred out, they are most likely at F2.8 or lower. And uh, if it's a group shot, I try to go with, I can go from F4 to F8, anywhere somewhere there, that works. So this is a good example. This is a shot I took at one communion, uh, this boy's communion, but you see all, everyone is in focus and it was at F8. And the same shot of a boy, that's a portrait, if it, it's at F2.8, the background is blurred, of course, and the boy is in focus. This is a deliberate shot I, I took at, at the wedding where I actually wanted to get all the details, including the floor. I didn't want to lose any details. That's why the aperture is F11. The way to think of it is, if you think of your eye, right? It's just like your eye, your lens is just like eye. If you sort of squint your eye, that means there's less light going in your eye. And that time you can actually focus on all the details, right? And, and let's say you, you, you're focusing on some subject and then your eyes wide open and you are focusing on this glass, then if you notice this glass is in focus, but the rest of it is blurred. I mean, try doing that. It's, 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 it's the same technique the camera uses. Then this is another example from the same wedding. If you notice it's F2.8 and my focus, it's deliberately on, on the rings. Uh, it's sort of giving that dreamy look for the guest book they have. Shutter speed. Shutter speed is uh, a great tool uh, for fast action or the slow dreamy shots. Uh, if you uh, choose a faster shutter, now this is definitely very, very logical, right? The, the shutter speed is the time you expose the sensor, you keep the shutter open. Shutter is what goes up and down and lets the light in. So first is the lens, the opening of the lens that uh, the light comes through. And then there's shutter in front of the sensor that will allow the sensor to be exposed for a given time. So the faster the shutter, right? Definitely you will get action frozen. Goes without saying, right? You are gonna be keeping the shutter open very little time, one, you know, like 2,500th of a second, you're going to freeze the motion. But the lower the shutter, you get the blurry shot. This can be used deliberately. So this is an example. This is the hummingbird right in my backyard, uh, thousandth of a second, right? The motion is, you know, frozen. I guess if I go even faster, I could still even get his wings even more uh, prominent, you know, with the details. That's one example. This is another example, one six, 1600th of a second, this is a heron uh, somewhere in Sudbury flying. Again, motion in freeze. This is a, the opposite example where uh, it's, you see the uh, lights going, I mean, down below the, those are the lights of the vehicles sort of going across. 
Uh, that's because this is probably somewhere around eight to 10 seconds of exposure. It's a long exposure at night. This is another at ice castles. This is not a tripod shot, by the way. This, uh, I didn't even have tripod. They probably didn't have, you know, even allow tripod there. And I put my camera on my bag and I was experimenting with that. I wanted to create this ghostly effect. Actually, once I got a, a bad shot and then I said, oh, this is cool. I can probably get this better. And you see how with the long exposure, I can get that effect of the clouds in the sky and also the people who look like ghosts there. I like this shot a lot. So definitely experiment wherever you go, experiment with your shutter and you'll be surprised what you can get. This is another shot, uh, a long exposure at Washington DC. We just had, like, we had food in the evening at one of the restaurants, Chinatown. And then we were waiting for our Uber or one of those. And I had some time to kill like 10 minutes. So I just put up my tripod and got some long exposure. That's, that's the light of the bus passing by. This is one thing I wanted to bring up. It, your Android can do this or even iPhone. On iPhone, if you shoot a shot with the water, in your scene as a live shot. You see this live? The live, keep the live mode on, that's it. And you take a shot, then what happens is iPhone by default takes multiple images of the same scene. And then all you do is you select, instead of live, you select long exposure of the photo that you've captured, which is in post, not even while taking the shot. And it converts it to a long exposure like this. So a very handy trick, uh, always works. Don't even need camera, uh, you know, DSLR, tripod, and whatever. Something you can use. ISO, last but not least, ISO is where, think of ISO as number of uh, bees getting you the light in on your sensor. So if one way is you can get the light by increasing the upper aperture. The other way you can get more light on your sensor is by opening the shutter for longer duration. <laughs> And the third way is you can actually increase the ISO. So more the ISO, more is the number of bees working hard to get that light inside. So that, that is the analogy sort of works for me. But notice uh, the higher the ISO, you're gonna get a grainy image. At a higher ISO, the image gets grainier and grainier. So one thing to note, use ISO, higher ISO rather, I should have said higher ISO, uh, wisely, you know. When, when you need a higher shutter speed, so especially when you're shooting wildlife, you're shooting birds, uh, fast speed, definitely you need to get more light in. And how do you do that? You, you can't reduce the speed because you need to freeze the motion. So you need to rely on ISO. So you actually have to have manual ISO and try to dial it as much higher as you can to the point that you, you don't get a grainy picture. Same in the low light conditions, you know, you're, if you're shooting events indoor, uh, definitely you want a uh, higher ISO, you know, that's your friend. And the other example is astrophotography. In astrophotography, uh, if you do not have the modern star trackers that track the stars, the, mo the moment of the stars, then if you use the slower shutter speed, you're gonna get the motion of the stars that's gonna ruin your shot. So you need faster shutter, but then if you have faster shutter, how else do you get the light in? You increase the ISO and the camera. So some uh, applications worth mentioning, uh, you can take a look at those. Uh, photo pills is one for the, the landscape. Uh, light pollution map is another one. It will tell you the uh, where the sky is clear, where is it is not. Clear outside helps with, uh, sometimes you want to shoot landscape without clouds, with clouds, so you can plan your day. Sky view light is another one. It can superimpose your stars. When you look up at the sky, it can show you, uh, you know, where the moon is, like the direction of the planets. Uh, you can feel free to take a photograph of it, or if, if you email me, I'll, I'll send you the list anyway. But these are Merlin bird ID, something I use all the time. It even has a sound recognition. You use the Merlin bird ID on your phone, wherever you are based on the birds in the vicinity, it will recognize which birds there are and it'll even tell you, oh, you have this guy, you know, on the left, you have this guy on the right. All right, that's it. Uh, thank you. <laughs>
Can come to any questions. Can you use Photoshop or do you, what, what, do you any uh, post shot manipulation? Uh, I use Lightroom and Photoshop. And what do you do primarily with those? So Lightroom, you can do all sorts of edits, basic edits. You can adjust the saturation, uh, brightness. Uh, you can uh, adjust the color. Uh, you can do, you can even create your own presets to edit your images. Th there's a lot more you can do. Nowadays, Lightroom even has uh, advanced masks. You can actually, it, can, it has AI, it can recognize the subjects and you can do some editing where uh, that applies only to the subject and the rest applies to the background, things like that. It's pretty cool. Uh, so most of the times I have used Lightroom. I'm not never, uh, I shouldn't say never, I've not, I very seldom needed the need to use uh, Photoshop. Photoshop I do land up using when I need to work with layers. Like for example, uh, some of those images I showed, like they were the composite of two images. I need to blend two images. That's when I use, uh, for stuff like that, I use Photoshop. Great question. Are you done? Sorry. You're done. <laughs> How do you manage your photos? Like the files? Do you put them in the cloud or is that oh, Great question. I, I, it, that's one idea. I guess uh, there are more business opportunities there. I mean, it, there's not, not enough uh, software to do that. What I do is essentially, I, I would recommend. Uh, depending on how serious you are about photographs, you, you at least you need like three sets of backups. <laughs> so the way I do it is really, I have my uh, SSD, solid state drives. That's where my masters lie. So I have multiple of them, three or four. And then and now, nowadays they are very cheap. You can get a two, two terabyte, four terabyte, even four. I don't know if they have anything above four terabyte here. But then um, I have my home, uh, uh, at home I have NAS. So NAS is my second storage. So I back up to NAS. And then uh, I use Amazon uh, Prime as my uh, third storage. Uh, I just store all photos there, no matter what. So, so that, that was your question, right? Related yeah. to the storage. Yeah. yeah. You could also use Google Photos if you want. So Flickr. Oh, Flickr is great too. Yeah. <laughs> Flickr does give unlimited uh, storage, yeah. right? How do you tell it? How do you categorize uh, your photos? I got a shot that I took in BAM three years ago. I, do you go to BAM? Do you go to the date? Do you, I mean, how do you? Great, great question. So I would recommend, uh, this is what I do. Uh, each person is different, of course. Uh, I essentially uh, keep them in different folders at the higher folder, like let's say events. Then I keep them with the years. So events, say 2000 to 2004. That's another folder underneath. Underneath 2000 to 2004, I have 2000, 2001, 2, 3, 4. Under each of those, I have a one folder per event, like 2000, like yyyy dash mm dash dd dot event name. So by doing that, it's agnostic of any software I use. It just common sense I can tell because usually I know when I went where, it's usually by the date that I can track. So this is just a rudimentary method. But on top of that, so this I do deliberately because it helps uh, tomorrow if I move away from one software to the other, I still have some way to fall back on. But within my Lightroom, I do tag them. So I do have uh, multiple uh, collections, Lightroom has something called collections where you can organize your photos, just like you said, categorize them. And I can say, you know, travel photos or like world photos and say landscapes, you know, so on and so forth. I travel with the photo, travel with Lightroom. The tag can travel with the photo. You actually put a keyword uh, for the photo yeah. and it will travel yeah. with the photo. What collections does is collections organizes photos based on tags. So if you say uh, tag some photos with birds, the tag will sit on the photo, but then collections is Lightroom's way or another layer on top of it saying collections is, oh, where are the photos with the tag birds? And then it'll present them to you. And then you can do advanced things on top of that. You can sort of, you cannot nest the collection. That's the only problem. But uh, 
the good news is you even if you have multiple catalogs and if you have one set of collection one collection or multiple collections with all your rules and whatnot you can import them in another lightroom catalog catalog without needing to redo it again so that's another thing Someone else is asking if you can recommend tutorials for someone who wants to shift from Photoshop to Lightroom. Maybe this is an email question. Sure, yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely email me and I can, okay. I can help. There's a, talking about tutorials, there's a great website I would highly recommend called Creative Live. It's, it is a paid website. They have a bunch of different categories business to art to whatnot but they have from time to time they have photography related uh, you know tutorials and uh, training and courses and whatnot that you can actually buy however from time to time they are also free they also offer they sort of run this pilot where they and there are prominent photographers out there who would come and teach you so that's mm -hmm. something worth trying creativelive.com one more question on mm -hmm. sure <laughs> oh, for every great shot, how many duds have you taken? <laughs> how many? Duds, just oh. How many shots do you take in order to get that one? Ah, <laughs> depends on the type of, uh, of a photo. So one way to think of it is definitely uh, fast action is where that will happen. It, it's not easy. It's come a long way. Uh, there was a time where you would need to worry about tracking the bird you would need to worry about uh, the settings and whatnot the modern cameras actually track your bird for you you know there are a lot of ways modern cameras do that for you so you can focus on the composition you can focus on the settings and whatnot uh, however uh, in case of uh, because of the the way a modern camera the design i'm not afraid to to take as many shots as i want because i i think of it as i use it to my advantage. Uh, but uh, that's where I would say uh, the ratio would be, in fact, with the modern cameras, the ratio is really nine sharp versus one dot. You'd be, you'd be surprised, but that's not me. That's because of the camera. That's because of the great camera I have. But uh, however, uh, if you were to do it the older with, with, the, with the older cameras, sure, you would probably get uh, maybe 60, 70% in the action scenario uh, duds and maybe 30, 40% uh, sharp shots. If you're shooting action, of course. Uh, but if you are thinking landscapes, the ratio is uh, much different. It's more like, typically you would get the shot you want. It's more like 90 to 90% 90 to 10%. It won't be that bad. But as action shots are... <laughs> One thing I would recommend is, uh, for the, uh, since I was talking about action shots, when you take action shots, there's one technique you can use. Always get your best shot first. That's my recommendation. So get your ISO higher, shutter faster, whatever you want, get the sharpest shot. Then you keep reduce, reducing your shutter speed in order to get the lower ISO shot. And with the modern camera, that's the advantage. That's when you can keep it in burst mode and let it go. All you need is one sharp shot. So don't be afraid. Uh, I mean, the way I say is, uh, don't need to be purist about it. That oh, I need to get all sharp or whatever. Use use the camera to your advantage. Thank you. Do you have a favorite um, time between sunset or sunrise? Can you tell the difference? Oh, oh, that's a tough one. Uh, I would say sunrise. Sunrise. Yeah, I was just sunrise. So you take a little early and then just keep taking it until you get. Yep. I, I, I think of sunrise because, uh, yeah, then there's day afterwards. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, after the sunset, I mean, unless, unless you are at a location where you are doing astro, I guess you can still spend more time and do some astro photography. But, uh, yeah, but that's a hard one. And depending on, on where you go, you could uh, have perfect sunset spots, and then uh, you would not do sunrises at all. Well, all right, thank you. I uh, thank you everyone for coming. I.
I do want to thank uh, the Valen Library and Putney for arranging this. And sorry, what is your question? Oh, I do. I do. I do. I do uh, teach also. Uh, like recently, you can take a look. Uh, in, Look at the reviews on the Facebook. But I uh, do offer uh, Zoom lessons if anyone is interested. I do offer one-on-one -on -one lessons, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one workshops, uh, to, so to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, feel free to reach out to me at uh, info at uh, You can check out my Facebook, Instagram, reach, reach me anyway. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have any opinion. Thank you again. Have a nice night.